Welcome, friends and fans, to another episode of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today, we are returning back to Tarek Nor with three members of the cast of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And now is the time for all of you in our chat room to begin typing in your questions for them. Immediately after this session, you'll have the opportunity to talk to them directly through our private chat options, as well as purchase autographs and personalized shoutouts as well, all of which are available right now at galaxycon.com. So without further ado, let's please bring out today's guests. First, he is an actor whose credits include Beauty and the Beast, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and author of the Merchant Prince series. Today, he joins us to discuss his role as owner of Cork's Bar, Grill, and Holo Sweet Cafe Arcade. Please welcome Armin Shimmerin. Hi there. Hello, sir. How are you doing in your part of the world? We're doing fine, thank God. <laughs> indeed, indeed. May, may we may we all do fine and then come out on the other, other end of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next. She is an actress whose roles include Dark Angel, Torchwood, and Family Guy. Today, she joins us to talk, discuss her role as Colonel Kira Nees. Please welcome Nana Visitor. Hey, everybody. Hello. How are you, young lady? I am really good. How are you doing? Sounds oh. like very well and peppy. Well, yeah, I'm from Orlando, so the rule hey. here is everybody's got to be having a you-know-what kind of day. Hey. <laughs> Even though we're closed, but never mind about that. <laughs> uh, our next guest, he is an actor whose body of work includes Dirty Harry, Charlie Varick, Hellraiser. Today, he joins us to talk about his breakout role as the former member of the Cardassian Obsidian Order turned humble tailor, Elam Garrick. Please welcome Andrew Robinson. Howdy, everyone. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm okay. I have no complaints. The world is falling apart, but you know, I'm okay. I, now, sometimes the best we can do is just take care of ourselves during all this. And that's, and that is, that is a worthy and oh. that's worthy enough in itself. Absolutely. So what I would love to hear from each of you is I'd like to hear just how Star Trek began for you. And I think Armin, this kind of goes, starts with you first, since you defined uh, the, the, the role of, of the Ferengi in Next Generation. Well, actually, uh, Star Trek started for me uh, before I was ever in front of the camera as a teenager, if that's possible. When I was a teenager, I used to watch religiously the first show, the original show. Yeah. And, and uh, while I was doing, years later when I was doing Beauty and the Beast, I was offered a very small role in, in Next Generation, which wasn't a Ferengi. And um, I snatched that up, despite the uh, argument I had with my agent about not taking it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I won that argument, and that small role, of basically I was a talking prop, uh, that small role led to that first Ferengi appearance in Next Generation in uh, uh, Last Outpost, which is the name of the episode. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And uh, at what point did you uh, hear the rumblings or the invitation that a spot was available for you on DS9? It wasn't available for me. Uh, it was available. I, I had heard that, that that they were bringing a Ferengi as a series regular onto Deep Space Nine. And I thought, well, that should be me because, uh, because why not? I've done the other Ferengi. Why shouldn't it be me? And uh, I... I pestered my agent and I got an audition relatively early on, but had no feedback. Maybe even I had the same experience, but uh, I had no feedback for about six or seven weeks, uh, which was really pissing me off. And uh, I had assumed after the sixth or seventh week that there was no future for me on Star Trek. And uh, lo and behold, I was asked to come in and audition for a callback and uh, where I met Max Grudenchek, who was also who played Rom, who was also auditioning for Quark. And uh, about a week later, I met Nana and the others uh, when we met all the powers that be in that room upstairs. And uh, lo and behold, I I think I've always been told this, so I'm assuming it's right. I was the first person hired for the show. Hmm. Hmm. Congratulations! We we are very glad for that. Uh, Nana, how did uh, how did this evolve for you? Uh, first of all, I can't hear Andy for some reason. But so if you talk to me, just know I'm not ignoring you. Second of all, you may hear I just moved into a new house, so uh, you may hear hitting of walls. And things like that. You know the TV people are here doing all their stuff. Um, 
the way it evolved for me was I think everyone had come in uh, for my role and I came in very late into the process. So I had one audition, they had call back for producers and that was it. I, it happened like within a week. It was really, really fast. And my manager, this, like your agent said, don't do it, science fiction. Back in the day, if you did science fiction, that was it. And you were a science fiction actor, no one else would hire you. You were, you know. And I said, no, I refused it. And uh, uh, they called me and walked me through this, what the sets were gonna be, who the other actors were, who the writers were. And uh, I fired my manager and, and did, <laughs> obviously did the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Did they uh, let you know up front with the character that they had had such an, uh, uh, the first time in a Star Trek series that a non-Federation, non-Starfleet character would play such an integral part? Did they, did they tell you that up front or was this something that sort of evolved? No, I got a Bible for, for the okay. part, but you know, I was told that Bajoran females in particular are very aggressive and, uh, and, <laughs> Oh, good. I can hear you. Andrew. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. I, 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 I can hear your expertise. Not. And, uh, yeah, no, I knew it. And, and the, the, the scene that I read for was the first scene in the pilot where she comes up against Cisco. So that was very informative. It was, it was like, okay, I got it. I got yeah. who this person is. The, the, the revolutionary who's trying to adjust to life without the revolution. Uh, right. And who has post-traumatic stress. Yeah. For real, you know, and we didn't know what it was called then. We do now. Yeah. Uh, but it, she fit the, she fit the, the mold of that perfectly. Absolutely. And yeah. you play, you played it perfectly. So thank you for that so much. Andrew, uh, as I understand it, originally you were just supposed to have sort of a one, 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 once appearance as Garrick and uh, you sort of insurance intended everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just thought it was a one-off. I mean, I've spent most of my, uh, my television career doing one-offs. So when I got this job, I didn't expect it to go beyond the, the, the one episode. Um, and I almost didn't do it because I, I, I uh, auditioned for Odo and they brought me back three times for that. Oh, wow. And, <clears throat> and then it came down to, me, uh, Garrett, Graham, and Renee. And so, and Renee, you know, rightfully got the role. Um, and then when they called me about this one episode, I, I didn't want to go back. I said, Jesus, man, you, you guys have, you know, have gutted me, you know, and you know who I am. You have my social security number, you know, what kind of underwear I wear. I mean, what, what the hell is the point? And so I said, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not going in, make me an offer or not. And then my wife, Irene, who is the wisest person in this household, said, you know, the phone is not ringing off the hook and we have to pay the mortgage. And so I went in and uh, and I got the role, which, uh, I, you know, thank God I did go in because I, you know, I, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. <laughs> it's it's uh, very interesting. Patty, can I make a comment, Patty? Please. Please. Um, listening to these three stories, uh, it is a tribute to our bosses, the producers, um, at least in Andy's in my case, and I don't know about it now, but, but the actors who were the runners up for the major roles were given very good roles, although they didn't get the roles they originally auditioned for. Yeah. Andy got uh, uh, his role, Max got his role, a number of other people got very nice roles. Yeah. And usually in TV, what happens if, if you're the second choice, they never want to see you again. Right. You know who read for my role was Mariska Hardigay, and she did okay. <laughs> it, you know, is somebody building something in uh, one of I'm our... sorry, it is. It's, it's, we moved in three days ago. That's and so... Not, it's just the world. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I can... That's... No. That, that's all that uh, Armin, you definitely do make a point that that you're right. The proofs of Star Trek. I've heard so many stories for I was up for this, I didn't get it, and they seemed almost almost like a, a, a almost like a stage in a theater, in the sense that, you know, we weren't good for this, but we really loved you and 
they had people in various circles of the family. And as soon as they found a right fit for them, threw them right on in. Uh, yeah, I actually, look, go ahead. Look at Jeff Combs. They kept bringing him back in any kind of role that they could find. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I got to, I got to host Renee a few years ago and uh, you know, he told me about his audition process and he had said that he had, he had been brought in nine times and on that ninth time, he finally told the room, he's just like, this is it. Either either give me a contract or I'm going home and not coming back. So, and uh, we miss him. Absolutely miss a him. Lot. So. And uh, I should have complained about going in three times. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you would have denied. So, and all three of you uh, spent a fair amount of time in the makeup chair for this series. Uh, Nana definitely uh, came out uh, ahead of that, but the minimal oh. amount of time. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, how 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 long did you have to spend in the makeup chair? I was like, it was it was. See, she was in and out for Christ's um, sake. The nose went on very quickly, but they had to paint my face so that it matched the rubber. Yeah. So that so it took about an hour and a half, but that right. was not compared to what the other guys did. Yeah, yeah. How about you? How about you, gentlemen? How? <laughs> I think Andy wins the prize between the two of us. Uh, not only was I believe his makeup more extensive, but also his costume was uh, uh, a horror chamber. I mean, True. when they. When we used to hear them being stripped out of those wetsuits. Yeah. And, yeah, you could hear the suction from the sweat and the <laughs> truly horrible. Yeah, horrible. yeah. I no. did a bit of Cardassian once, and it I, I I was traumatized. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it, or you, Armin. Uh, either one of you. You well, they got better, and and those guys, you know, were were wonderful. Westmore and 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 his crew. You know, at, at the beginning, it did take about four hours. And then when I had, I think I had one time, I had a call at two o'clock in the morning. And and I, I I just, this is beyond the pale. Yeah. This is, I've never, ever, unless we were doing night shooting, that's one thing. But this was like, you know, but it did get better. And uh, and they really did try to make it easy for us. And I'm, I'm although I hated the makeup process, I love my makeup artist and, and, and I knew that the makeup was essential for what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, everything behind me, my entire house, was paid by the overtime I got from uh, coming in early. So, uh. <laughs> That's true. That's absolutely true. I never made better overtime in my life. <laughs> Gotta love those early call times, indeed. Yeah. Uh, I think I'd get Arvin. I'd give you the edge because you had to wear the mouthpiece as well. And I think Andrew, you didn't have to put anything in your mouth, did you? No, no, I didn't. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. So definitely about that way. What's uh again? Uh, did did the series, and you've all uh been on the convention circuit for a while. Uh, events. What's been what's been a favorite memory you've had of uh with Star Trek fandom? I for me, it, it's. I, you know, I, I'd been doing this, you know, stuff a long time and I mean, doing this acting and, uh, and I'd never been in a position where I met the people who watched me before. Uh, this was the very first time and I had no idea what to expect. And, and, and so for me, and it still is true now, I, I actually enjoy, I enjoy going to conventions. I enjoy meeting the people who support me. You know, because without them, you know, I'd be, you know, doing my 99 seat theater gigs and uh, collecting unemployment. Uh, so I am I am grateful to them. And I find that as a group, they are um, very kind and considerate for the most part. Occasionally, I'll run into someone who is uh, barking mad and but I'll just bark back and that's OK. But for the most part, it's a, it's a pleasure. The spectrum uh, that the fans cover, it's just incredible. You yeah. meet everybody yeah. in every aspect of life, livelihood, age. It's all, uh, you asked what was meaningful in, in terms of meeting people who saw the show. Uh, I remember very one of the first conventions, a very old lady came up to me and just raised up her shirt and showed me the numbers on her wrist. Oh. And that was, and she, she 
Kira spoke to her, that was like, mm -hmm. I remember this, this guy in his 40s carrying a computer and I thought, oh, he wants to show me something that, you know, a game that he's on or something. That, yeah. That's fun. I was sitting at the table and he opened up the computer and showed me um, this little thing landing on a planet. And I said, that looks so realistic. That's a, those are amazing graphics. And he said, no, I landed this. <laughs> he was like, from, yeah, he was <laughs> legit. And I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. I mean, all these people who, um, were enthused about the show. It's it's just great. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with what everyone has said. I, I will add one last thing. One of the things that always hits me the the best and the hardest, and is that someone will come up and say, explain to me that their family had gone through some tragedy that uh, either a medical tragedy or financial tragedy or some sort of tragedy they just lost them and that the family together were able to get through their hard times by watching our show and that we gave them something that they could hang on to while they experienced the tragedy that comment comes up quite often uh for me and um and i am enormously grateful for the opportunity be part of the franchise that helped them recover. Yep, that's right. So well spoken. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Our producers say we've got some questions from our audience available. So I'll ask Vendette to roll our first one. And this comes from Leaf. What were you doing in your life when you got the call for Deep Space Nine? I can answer that first. I was standing on the stage rehearsing Hamlet. And uh, the stage manager came running up to me and said, you have a phone call, your agent called. And so, it, and, uh, I, and the director said, okay, Armin, we're gonna call it, you know, uh, a, 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 a halt on the rehearsal for a second. I, I ran over to uh, the phone and um, the agent said, you got it. So I, I gave up Hamlet to do Deep Space. Actually, um, I didn't do Hamlet, because I got to do Hamlet and Deep Space. What part of Hamlet? Polonius, which I've just recently done again. Oh, nice. I'd like to see that. Excellent. Gentlemen, lady, uh, anyone? Leif, that's a good question. Um, I had given birth two and a half months before, and I was wow. back auditioning. I was, I remember I was, I was binding my stomach <laughs> so that I could look like I, I hadn't given birth. And um, I was auditioning for LA Law and the casting director said, you're not gonna get this. It was just a silly guest star. She said, but there's something I want you to come in for. And mm. it was Deep Space Nine. Not bad, not bad. How about you, Andrew? You know, I, 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 I actually, I don't know. I mean, it was a busy, yeah. it was a busy time in my life. Uh, there were all kinds of stuff that was going on, but I have no idea what I was doing. I obviously wasn't working because I was available to do the job. Let me follow up the follow up this then. Hey, uh, where Patty, were you? Hey, Patty, hold on. Just a second. I have a question for Andy. Were you in Idlewild or were you in L.A. at that time? Oh, no. I was in L.A. You were in LA. I was in L.A. because I, I, it was not too long after I'd done Liberace, I think. You know, so I mean, it was all kinds of stuff that you know it was that was happening, but but I can't remember. No, Don't no ask worries, me no I had for breakfast this morning, please. <laughs> How about this? Uh, when when did you get contacted about returning to the role? Since it was uh, originally intended to be a one-off. I was doing a, a Broadway play in New York, and I was watching the World Series in my apartment, and I got a call. And uh, that's and when they, when they when they call and I was and they, when they called me back and I said oh that's great because I I was very happy I, I you know the I the makeup and the and the costume and all that threw me for a loop to, at the beginning, but then I'm you know I had these I had these scenes with Sid and Sid and I had a great time, uh, and and I and I and I was working with you know with with the, the, a fabulous company of actors, so I was very happy to, you know to be called back. 
And so, the, but and it, and it turned out sadly the my my play uh, in on Broadway, you know, it didn't last very long. So I was able to come back and do it. What was it? What was the play? It was a Frank Gilroy play called Any Given Day, with Seda Thompson, Paul Benedict had directed. It was it was lovely, but it was I'm afraid it was just too soft for Broadway. Mm, understandable. So, Leaf, thank you. Great question. Uh, let's see what's next from Vicky. What are your favorite go-to quarantine snacks? Mm. Okay, you get them at Costco, and they're these little Parmesan crisps. And I'm addicted to them. That, that is one of my favorite. Court. You know them. I just discovered those. Those are phenomenal. Oh, so good. Yeah, Costco uh, will deliver them, which is how I get them. Fair. I'm not going out yet. I'm not. I'm just not going out yet. Uh, well, oh, pick me up some pistachios because I love the pistachios from you know. <laughs> yeah, Costco. All you right. Pepper ones. Yes, love them. Uh, for me, uh, uh, my wife is now making a lot of bread, so that's my go-to quarantine. I just eat a lot of bread, and, and I'm beginning to spread as uh, as much as uh, the oleo is on it. Is, uh, is she doing like a standard type of bread, or is she experimenting banana she, bread? Uh, she experiments with various kinds, but but it's a, basically a, a white bread. And, and I, we have come to find out one of the hardest things to find during these days is bread flour. Nana has turned us on. I think Nana has turned us on to a place to find it. But um, we uh, finding bread flour is very difficult. Yeah, it is. Indeed, indeed. So bread and garlic crisps and pistachios. All right, yeah. Vicky, you have a laundry list. Parmesan crisps. Parmesan crisps. I'm sorry. Very Parmesan. important. Parmesan. Crisps. I stand they correct. Are, they are phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Vicky, thank you. That was a fun one. Uh, what do we have next? From Philip, what do you think the legacy of Star Trek Deep Space Nine is? And were you, ha were you happy with your character's development and the, uh, the overall legacy it leaves to Trek? Yeah, I am happy with it. And I was happy with my character's development. I mean, I got such a, an arc to who she was. It really went the seven years. So much so that I could have seen going on with it for a few more. Um, I loved what they did with my character. And um, I think the legacy of Deep Space Nine is the more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, I, I think that, that it's, there are questions that Deep Space Nine brought up and, and you know, kind of held up to look at, for people to look at, that are completely, uh, uh, for this time, it, it, they're the same. And I think Deep Space Nine is is very timely. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Andy? No, you know, I, you know, the thing is about this show, it, it really changed my life. I came in expecting to do one episode. And you know, when I say I, it changed my life, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating because uh, what the show did is because I wasn't a regular and I, I was a recurring character, uh, it, I did enough shows so that I made enough money so I could do stuff that didn't make money. Like I, at, during this time is when I started directing. And, you know, when I started directing, I had to learn a whole new craft. And, uh, it, it, and, and, the, and you know, I started directing in theater. And then because I won, I won some awards, I got some notoriety for some shows that I did with a, with a company that Armin had worked with. It, worked with, it was a member of the Matrix Theater Company, uh, both Armin and his wife, Kitty. Um, I then, uh, you know, I, I pulled a fast one on Rick Berman. I knew I was going to win these two awards, and I knew that they were going to be printed in the LA Times that morning, you know, the LA Drama Critics Awards. <clears throat> and so I made sure that the papers were delivered that morning, and then I called Berman's office, and he answered the phone. 
And and I, I, my guess was right. He had heard about the article in the paper in which I, I had won these awards and it was the first time anybody had won two directing awards in the same season. And so at, at that point I figured he was, you know, maybe ready to like uh, accept an offer of, you know, a, a request to direct Star Trek shows. And he did. Um, that is the legacy for me, how it, you know, and then from there, it's, it's even, it's even more, but I won't get into that now. Uh, the, in terms of the legacy of the show itself, thematically and what it means, I don't know. I mean, we, here we are, we're stuck in this world where we live now. I mean, being assailed on all fronts, uh, politically, medically, I mean, personally, financially. Uh, I mean, times are hard. Uh, and it's nice to perhaps turn on the television and see a show where there's a 24th century uh, that has good actors in it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so for me, um, I was uh, not always happy about the arc of my character, mm -hmm. um, but I think starting towards the end of the second season, they began to realize that Quark could actually do something that was honorable every now and then. Yes. Uh, so certainly appealed to me. And uh, I, I, was, I was very happy about the, the episodes where I got to have what I would always call the Spock moments, when the alien would speak to the humans and say, you know, you may think that you're perfect, but look at your faults. Um, those were some of my favorite episodes. So, and, and I would say that there was a great learning curve between the second to the last episode and the last episode. Um, in the second to the last episode, um, they had my character revert back to where he was pretty much at the beginning of the show. And I saw really for the first time in my own mind how far my character had progressed from that time. And I uh, was quite astonished by that. I, it had crept up on me and I had never noticed it, that how much the character had changed. So that's the arc for me. The legacy of the show, I think Nana is right, that, that you know, the more the change, the more we stay the same. We have, because from what Andy said as well, we're dealing with strange times, uh, certainly, with uh, uh, an understanding of what the African-American community has been suffering for many years. Um, we always were reminded of that on the show. We had a phenomenal actor who was very much concerned with uh, Black, Lives, Black Lives Matter, our captain, Avery Brooks. And um, I think one of the legacies of the show is, is his performance and what they wrote for him to demonstrate the problems of being a black man in a basically a white and orange society. Yeah, that's right on. Right on, Armin. Absolutely, absolutely. Philip, thank you. Great question. Uh, let's roll another one from Dave. What is the one piece of advice you would give to your fans? <laughs> hmm. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Wear a mask. Wear, wear a mask. mask. We and all wore masks for seven years. Wear a mask. Mask. <laughs> yeah, just really don't, 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 don't listen to the idiots who who want to, you know, send us out into the plague. Really, take care of yourselves. It's so important. If I may add to that, um, uh, we in the theater. Uh, know what being an ensemble player is, which means that you help everybody else. That's right. Wearing a mask is not only for your own protection. That's the selfish reason to wear a mask. You're wearing a mask and you're keeping your distance in order to save other lives. It just to make sure that the disease does not spread and, and catch somebody unawares. Uh, so uh, I've been saying to people, don't be a diva. Don't only worry about your own uh, ego, worry of be an ensemble player, uh, work for the good of, of the entire ensemble. Absolutely. And there are plenty of stylish masks available right now. 
So no excuse on that. A reminder, if you'd like to chat with our panelists like I am now or purchase an autograph or get a personalized recorded message, please sign up at galaxycon.com. Dave, thank you for that question. And let's do another one. From James, what do you think when you see your like uh, what do you think of when you see your likeness in an action figure or toy? <laughs> uh, see, I love this guy. I think, I think I think he's really cute. I talk to him, he talks back to me. You know, we have we have great conversations. He tells me, you know, like how he was really happy that I played him. I tell him how happy, you know, I was that, you know, that 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 the writers wrote for him. So, you know, it's it's a it's a lovely it's right on my desk. It's my it's my dear memento. It's Excellent. Thing. It's definitely weird to see yourself as an action figure. And it was particularly weird because my boys were little and liked action figures when they were little. So that was that was bizarre. They'd find because they'd send us all the merchandise and they'd find yeah. them and they'd be and it was like, nah, that that's not a good idea. I don't like this. Blown <laughs> <laughs> up every two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. I, I look at my action figure and go, who the hell are you? <laughs> James, thank no. you. Now, let, let me show you another. I'm going to okay. show you another action figure. This okay. is from a Star Trek fan who one day showed up. You know, this, this movie, Dirty Harry, which was my first movie, which kind of put me on the map as, as a crazy man. And then he came up with this guy. You know, the Scorpio killer. Wow. And, you know, which is like, you know, and, and it was wonderful. I mean, when I saw this, I just, you know, fell off my chair. Uh, I have rights. Uh, I talked to him too. Yeah. So, uh, uh, <laughs> well, hopefully he doesn't talk back considering what kind of no, character no, that guy was. <laughs> uh, you can have a conversation with yeah. Garrick, but the Scorpio killer? Ooh. <laughs> That's very good. Very good, man. You made that guy bad <clears throat> news. Uh, yeah. uh, James, <laughs> thank you for that. That was a good one. What do we have next? Uh, from Patrick, were there any practical jokes on the set or any running gags you may have uh, uh, done with each other? We yeah. were funny. Patrick, and thank you very much um, for what you say. I, we weren't that funny. I tried. I tried to get practical. No. But what, you know, the set really is run by whoever is number one on the call sheet. And that was Avery Brooks. And he, it was more um, like a college a, a college class run thing. Everyone called them, you know, Mr. Shimmerman, good morning. And it, it's how it was. And it was very, we were all deadly serious. But also it was pretty dark, you know. We weren't visiting planets and meeting different people, and here we are here. It was we were going through all this angst, and I think maybe that's that contributed, or we're just not funny. I don't know. We're just no fun. We're not Jonathan Frakes. Speaking no, of, that's that's right. That's I right. Mean, or Johnny Phillips. Uh, oh my God, those guys I mean, were so funny. Yeah. They would come on our set and be funny, but we weren't, we were deadly serious about yeah. it. Absolutely fair. Absolutely fair. Uh, Patrick, thank you for that one. Unless anybody else was, uh, can't, I can't remember something odd that happened. It was business as usual. Yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, uh, what's next? <laughs> this comes from Shannon. What are the challenges of playing a villain? Or a character who vacillates between being devious, charming, and evil. That's for you guys, obviously. Well, obviously. well, obviously. The, the the mirror mirror universe of of Kira. All right. That's and right. That's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And you were so badass in that. You that were. You were. Really. <laughs> I mean, <whoa. laughs> uh, I remember uh, this question is actually one that I was very much concerned with. Uh, and on several occasions, I would take the writers out to lunch and say, listen, I only want you to answer one question for me. I only have one question. Just tell me what my character's IQ is. Because if you can tell me that, 
then I'll know how to play this character. Because if I'm really devious, then my IQ uh, would be a lot higher than some of the episodes that you have me in. Um, but um, because I was trying to ingratiate myself with the people around me, the characters uh, and the audience, um, I, I learned to be enormously charming. Uh, uh, a number of people have been kind enough to call me Charmin Armin, and I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. let's go ahead, Nana. There's Armin. I saw an 8 by 10 of yours, and you were as Quark, and you look like an you know, a, a 1930s, 40s movie star, like burning the camera, sex appeal. And it's like, how do you do that in a big butthead? But you think <laughs> you look like a movie star. Right. You, know, <laughs> you do that because the butthead uh, looks at overacting. It, it, oh, it comes out like a film noir, but yeah. it's the butthead is muting out the large over the top acting. Is what's happening. Well, wasn't. Uh, wasn't one of the tangential uh, inspirations for Quark, uh, Rick from Casablanca? Wasn't that one of the things? I'd, I'd heard that several years ago. I could be wrong. You have to ask the writers. I know nothing about that. Fair. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the vacillation that Shannon talks about, you know, was for me and and Garrick, was the mo that was the most interesting thing about the character is because he had there was a lot of subtext because he was a liar because he was you know uh on terak nor uh, under false circumstances uh, or suspicious circumstances i'm i'm still not sure how good a tailor he was um you know it, it's you, you when you play somebody who's a liar i think Ar armin is right to to make you have to be really kind of crafty and smart you know, for instance, to understand that you never tell the same lie twice, you know, and, and that's that's really important. You know, if, if I'm going to give any advice to the fans out there, if you're a liar, you know, you're going to fail. Just repeat your lies. Change them up. Change them up. And for me, I told the truth. I When, when I was uh, the Mary Universe uh, intendant, uh, I just changed my mind about how I flipped my yeah. mind about what is true. And what was true was I deserved everything. And so it made it very simple and everything yeah. was wrong and really, so it's a sociopathic point of view and that made it simple for me. I, it was easy. I, it would have, yeah, I think it would have been very easy just to make her tyrannical and almost Cardassian like, but instead the <laughs> idol hedonism, shall we say? Uh, that, that was a wonderful affectation for the character. If, so. if I may uh, just jump in one more time, uh, the, the credit to the success of those two characters is a, is a tribute to the two actors you have in front of you. They are phenomenal actors who the writers could trust to, to play such intricate, involved, deep characters and, and fascinate you. Actors of lesser quality could not have done what they done. They did. Thank absolutely. You. I thank absolutely concur. And Shannon, thank you. That was a great one. Uh, what do we have next? From number one Trek fan. Star Trek is always topical and DS9 was never afraid to be controversial. Oh my, <laughs> what would DS9 be talking about now if it were still on? Hmm. Well, that would be, we, as I said earlier, we would be talking about racism. We did talk about yeah. racism. We, yes. we would be talking more well, about we talk. We, we we hit it all. Politics. Uh, That's right. The Bajoran right. who were in power, who were dirty. Uh, it's all so much stuff that we touched on. Our program was not about boldly going anywhere. Uh, our our program was bo about boldly living with each other and with people that you didn't necessarily see eye to eye with. At various times, I, my character didn't see eye to eye with the other two characters right here. But we had to live with each other. We were quarantined together on a station, and we had to learn how to figure that out. And if we, if we didn't like someone, we still had to figure out how to deal with them. Uh, and that's what we would be talking about today, about, again, how do we live with people that aren't familiar? Because we must do that. We must learn to live with people that aren't familiar. And, and boldly going within oneself, 
And that's that's another un, you know often undiscovered country. Is like who are we? Who are you? What is what is a you know, a, a human? Uh, what is an alien? And I, I have to say that one of the surprising uh, challenges for me when I got this job is what is an alien? How how do I you know because you know if you're, if you're playing a human being and the human being is is delineated in the script as su such and such who does whatever you know then okay that's fine I, you know I can I can relate to that I'm a human being but I'm not a Cardassian I'm not a Ferengi I'm I you know I'm 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 a human being so w what is an alien and how do I relate to the the alien within me uh, and and what alienates me from the rest of society. I mean, the, the, the Deep Space Nine was never, never uh, unattached to those questions. Yeah. It was always probing. It was on, like, for instance, the, there, the, the episode that I keep on coming back to is the episode that, that Nana and my friend Harris Ewan did called Duet, Harris. which is an extraordinary episode. Uh, and and could only have been done by the two of them, as far as I'm concerned. It, and it's like, who does that? Where does that come from? I mean, that's 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 major. It really is major. And 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 the, you know, I used to poo-poo, you know, like, oh yeah, this we're doing science fiction. And of course, the, you know, the, the the in the industry, the the bias is well, we don't give awards to people who act in science fiction things because that's science fiction that's fantasy it's for, for children you put on these funny masks and you make these funny sounds and, and whatever you know but the the great irony is that here is this show that's dealing and especially at that time what other show was doing that what other show was doing that and i know there were very, very few because I was doing them, usually playing the idiot of the week in something, yeah. you know, <laughs> holding up a gun saying, you know, stick him up, Jack, or, you know, I've got your daughter. I want a hundred million dollars. Bullshit like that. <laughs> and then you walk into this show and you think like the, 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 the episode of The Wire uh, the, 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 that I did about addiction. Yeah, it's, it's major. Absolutely. I know uh, early on, some people thought that DS9 was deviating from Roddenberry's vision, but I, I always said it challenges it and it shows that it comes through at the end when 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 people are on point and people learn, learn how to live with each other, not to love each other, but when they just again, like you said, when they learn how to deal with each other as neighbors, as, co as cohabitants, that's process. Yes. Yep. Probably. That's that's the road. That's the road utopia. Number one Trek fan, thank you so much for that. That was excellent. Uh, we got time for a few, but let's do a. We, we got one more here from from Mike. What is your favorite memory of working with Rene Abdullah? Oh, Aubert Jean Aubert Jean there you okay. go. All right. He never corrected me when I said it the other way, but he's so used to it. And wow. I spent, I spent he numerous, the comment, <laughs> I YouTubed it several times and every show he was on was always introduced differently. So thank you. I oh, will, I will know this now. You can Hello. take it from, you know how to pronounce it. Oh, there's one. Oh, there's one. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't have the easiest names on this show. No, we didn't. The, yeah. the weirdest names on this show. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh my God! I uh, 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 we were all very close to Renee and to Renee's character Odo. Uh, I would say that uh, Nana's romance with uh, or, or Kira's romance with Odo is only topped by Quark's romance with Odo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my favorite, my favorite moments uh, with Renee are probably um, early in the morning before we're on the set and we're sitting right next to each other in the makeup trailer, uh, just catching up and running our lines and deciding how we're going to do the scene. Um, th those are heartwarming moments for me. Um, one of my favorite, only because I've been looking at it recently, uh, 
There's a scene actually with the three of us, Nana, Renee, and I, uh, in the very last episode where uh, Odo and Quark say goodbye to each other. Uh, and Nana is there, Kira's there. Um, and um, I've been watching that and near to tears because uh, we're saying goodbye. And, and unfortunately, in real life, we had to say goodbye as well. I think uh, when I think of uh, Andy, you go. I'll be back. You go. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, I'd, I'd known Renee for a long time, and uh, we, we'd done some work together before. And um, I got very close to him, uh, I, I, you know, because we were always kind of like as young, younger actors, we were always kind of like territorial and, and you know, and uh, jealous of each other. Or I certainly was jealous of him and <clears throat> and and that bullshit that you do when when you're a kid. And then when we got on Deep Space Nine, um, we 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 behaved like humans with each other. And then we had that two-part series in which Garrick is torturing Odo. And 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 it was like working together, like it was it was it was a joy. And yeah. Yeah. What comes to my mind is um doing conventions. We, you know, they would book us on conventions very often together. And before you get on stage, you're walking through usually this huge convention hall rest, you know, the, the, the kitchen and it smells and it's awful and the garbage is there and people are packing, <laughs> yeah. you know, trays of food. <laughs> yep. And he would be so grumpy as only Renee could be. And he was like, I, he, and it, everything was wrong and everything was bad. And the minute we walked backstage, you could see like his veins were just filled with light. He loved performance. He loved the stage. He loved right. everything about the communication and the storytelling. He loved it. And I loved watching him light up like that. That's my favorite. Memory. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. I love the edit I love the edibles he would give me on you know when we met <laughs> on conventions. <laughs> Very nice. Very I nice. heard it were, uh, quite interesting. <laughs> I, uh, I, I had opportunity to spend an hour with him on stage, and uh, this is early in my career, and he was absolutely one of the best guests. He was very nice. He, he, he thanked me afterwards because I went deep diving and talked about Baba Black Sheep and his work in the 70s. I got a funny story about him, about you were an episode of Wonder Woman, which took place in a comic book uh, convention. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, "Yeah, I have. I've thought about that occasionally, and uh, <laughs> just just a very generous man." And uh, after backstage, we talked a lot about the stage, and he he told me some fun stories about City of Angels, which I had an opportunity to see him on in Broadway. And uh, yeah, I I'm disappointed I won't be able to host him again. No. But uh, he's absolutely had a wonderful legacy, and I envy you all for spending the time with him that you did. Uh, one last thing about Renee, uh, because you touched upon it, Patty. Um, we know him from TV and the film work that he's done, but he was a prince in the theater. Yeah, he was. He was a he, he, stage actor. He, he was a huge actor in the theater, and he did, uh, when he was a young man, his first Broadway show was Coco, for which he got a Tony nomination. Um, in the theater, he was royalty, and, yeah. and it was, it was uh, very flattering for me to stand on stage with him. Broadway Hall of Fame. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Mike, thank you so much for that. That was a great question for us to leave off of. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with the cast of Deep Space Nine, but it does not have to be yours. If you'd like to chat with uh, any member of our panelists here or get a picture, get an autograph or a shout out, please sign up at galaxycon.com. Uh, gentlemen and lady, thank you all so much. It's been a privilege to serve you today. Any final words for our audience before we go? Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe indeed. And thank you, Patty. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. And, and, and really, do stay safe. You know, keep that mask on. Be shelter in place. Uh, let's hope that in a year's time from now, all of us will be well behind us. Yeah. 
Amen to that. Thank you, GalaxyCon. Uh, be sure to join us tomorrow. We will be joined by not one, not two, but three former Doctor Whos, as well as the cast of Marvel's The Defenders. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for those great questions. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care and keep washing those hands.